Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. Remember to subscribe to our free podcast so you won't miss any of our illuminating content. Here is episode 191. A lot of people would be happier and more fulfilled if they stopped looking towards their immediate job for everything and started taking control of everything else outside of their job. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you are ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the luminous mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Derek McGill. We welcome Derek back to our podcast. He's a college dropout, marketer, business strategist, and career expert. After dropping out of college during his sophomore year, Derek started a marketing company that went on to generate millions of dollars in business for clients. He is currently the director of marketing at Praxis, which we love. We sponsor them and has consulted with companies such as Voice and Exit, the Foundation of Economic Freedom. Glock Store, Collier's International, Daily Caller, and Under Tech. Derek is also the author of How to Get Any Job You Want, which we discussed really a lot more intensively on episode 147. But welcome back to The Luminous Mind, Derek. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited. You know, I've been listening to a number of the episodes because uh, obviously Praxis has been uh, sponsoring the show for a little bit, and uh, I'm excited to come back and talk with you. Yeah, I'm excited to have you back. Last time we talked with Derek, we talked about a lot of, you know, in extensively a lot of his own paradigm shifting and his book of how to get any job you want. So I really recommend that you go back and listen to that episode because it's we had some really great discussions. I think now we're going to like really move our discussion into more of the direction of what, you know, we're doing with Praxis and and being that proud sponsor, what Praxis is up to and then also what Derek's been up to lately. Let's start with maybe Praxis and talk about some of the new things that you're doing and, and the ways that you've kind of moved that to fit the model that students need. Yeah. So, you know, it's been, a, it's been an interesting last couple of, of months, I would say, really in the last six months or so. And I, I, I don't recall when, when I was on your show. I think it was... Um, it was the, in ju- uh, July of last yeah, summer. I think it was the summer. Yeah, yeah. It was the summer. So July... I think July or August. And, you know, since then, really, I think starting in about September or so, we've experienced some pretty incredible growth. We've grown by about 400%. It's been a really exciting kind of wild time in a way because a lot of media attention started happening. We went on to Fox News. Um, We have a a story coming out in CNBC soon. And so there was just a lot of things that uh, kind of fell into place. And suddenly we started getting, you know, 10 times, 20 times more applicants than we were getting in the past. And it's been really cool to watch, I think, uh, just the number of people who are are looking for alternatives to the traditional education system. And, and one of the things I'm seeing over and over and over again is, is people who are, you know, who have you know, parents, for example, who have kids who are 12 and 13 who are knocking on our door and saying, you know, do you guys have anything for us as well? <laughs> and uh, that's been that's been pretty fun to see as well, because I, I always like to tell people, you know, in a sense, there's a lot that we can do at the college level, but it's it's almost too late in many ways if, if you're trying. It's not too late, but it's much harder, let's say, than uh, if, if you were to, to start doing you know, a lot of the stuff that, that you talk about in your podcast and a lot of the stuff that, that Praxis does with its participants. If you start doing that at a much earlier age than the, the college level. And so it's, it's always really cool to see, I guess, the, 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 the growth of, of interest in the uh, uh, younger and younger ages in something like Praxis. Yeah. And we talked about that um, kind of before we started uh, recording of how, you know, we we need to spend some time de-schooling ourselves. And I think a lot of younger parents especially are really open to that. Like I had a horrible experience and and they're they're not doing the Stockholm situation where they're just putting them back, you know, perpetuating. A lot of them are actually, (laughs) I think is great because they're looking for different alternatives for their kids. And Definitely moving to that self-directed uh, mindset is awesome. So what is your advice usually to those parents and wor- working with those young people? Yeah. So just from, I mean, from my experience working with, uh, I- I've been working with a lot of kids who are like 14 to uh, you know, 18, 19 years old, and then you know, some beyond as well. But you know, in, in that age group in particular, what I find is the kids that are always more capable than we think. 
Oh, yeah. I think that's something right there is, is just, you know, don't underestimate your kids. Even, you know, and even if you're, I think one of the problems that happens too is, is parents, they judge their kids, parents, particularly if they're in school, they judge their kids based off of how they're behaving in a kind of schooled environment. And they use that as evidence to say that they're not ready for something else or something bigger. I think the problem is, is, is a foundational problem though. And so, you know, rather than, than writing your kid off and saying, oh, they're not mature enough or they're not this or whatever, not smart enough, they're not self-directed enough. You have to get them out of that environment first and give them time to to de school as opposed to kind of expecting everything from them up front. And this is one of the biggest challenges I see with parents. I, I go to you know conferences and speak at meetup groups and to do some webinars and stuff like that. And, and parents will regularly say, "Oh, that sounds great, but like I know firsthand that my kid's not ready yeah. for that." Or something. And that's usually not the case, frankly. It's that the kid is in an environment in which the incentives are such that they behave a certain way. So the, the example that I usually give is, you know, when I, when I was in like seventh and eighth grade, I played video games like you wouldn't believe. I mean, you know, 18 hour days on the weekend, fall asleep for six hours, wake back up and play again. You know, you had to rip me off the game. And, you know, you can look at that two ways. You can see that as like, oh, this is a kid who's just wasting time and who's not going to be ready for stuff because that's all he wants to do. He, he, how, how could he possibly go, you know, work or take on some kind of projects when all he wants to do is play video games? But for me and, and my perspective as a kid going into that was, you know, this was the only place really where I could, uh, there was an online games where I was interacting with other people. These were the only place where I could, in a sense, behave a bit entrepreneurially and talk with people you know, like I was sort of an adult or like I had a bit of personal agency. Um, it was the only place that I could sort of be in an unschooled environment because everything else was structured for me. And I, I look back now and I realize like I wouldn't have been have been doing all of that. I wouldn't have been playing those games if I had alternatives outside of that. Yeah. You know, and, and so for parents, it's like you see your kids doing certain things and it's very easy to judge them for that. But look at like the incentives that exist for that kid right now. Try to get at the core of why they're behaving in a certain way. And I swear, oftentimes they're, they'll be more than willing to change their behavior into a more productive way if they have that kind of option. You know, for me, it's like all that video game stuff, all of the sort of, I guess, personal habits that might be frowned upon kind of dropped the moment I, I had a bit more agency and a bit more freedom. And I suddenly it's like, oh, I, I can go, you know, sell t-shirts online and I can take on some projects and I can write online and do these other things. Like that became a much more clear option. That's the biggest thing, really. Yeah. When I talk to people outside of my podcast, of course, you know, just on the street and stuff about self-directed learning, they're like, well, you know, if I would have just been given the opportunity to do whatever, I would have just played video games. And I'm like, but do you really think, though, you were never given a chance otherwise to unplug? Yes. You know, you were always like forced and told to what to do. And then as soon as you had a moment to yourself, of course, you needed to unplug, you know, because you needed that exactly. time. And I'm, that's what I keep telling. I mean, I watch my own children do it when I pull them out of an online school. It took my daughter a good year to not to get used to the idea of like, no one's telling me what to do. I mean, she was like floundering, you know, she didn't really know yep. what to do. And but once she kind of had that time, like, wow, I can do whatever I want. You know, the sky is the limit. And they do some amazing things. And we really, I think the saddest part is when parents project their experience onto their kids, and what their kids oh, totally. would be like. I mean, that's just super sad. But that's yeah, awesome. You know, I imagine I'm not a parent yet. But I, I, I totally get it's probably frustrating to see your kid do things that you think are, are wasteful and whatnot. But you almost got to you, you almost got to let them do that now because it's going to happen either now or it's going to happen when they get out of college. I mean, the kids that I work with who are, are graduating college, like a lot of them are lost. A lot of them are totally clueless about what they want to do. They don't know how to pursue new opportunities. They don't know how to learn on their own. And like this is stuff that if you force your kids to, you know, just just follow a, a routine your entire life and don't let them sort of make mistakes on their own uh -huh. or or get used to, you know, wasting time so that they can learn, you know, how to how to fix that. If you don't do it now, it's going to be a problem when they get out of school. And there's a lot less leniency yeah. really from society when you get out of school. And so I like to think that there was this I think there's a story about you know, sub dairy schools where there was a kid who they got out of regular school and they put him in this this more self-directed school. And he literally spent like a whole year or something just fishing, doing nothing else, just fishing. And everyone was like, how do we get him to do something else? Like, you know, this seems like he's just wasting his time. He's not learning. He's not studying. He's not doing anything. But then one day he just decided, OK, I'm ready to study. 
and he went off and became really, you know, really intelligent and really successful. And I think that's, that's a, a, a good kind of story to keep in mind as well when you're raising kids. Also, I would say I help the kids to deal with their parents because the thing I've noticed, and this is maybe a controversial claim, but like parents can be even great parents, really loving parents can be a terrible influence on their kids' lives in many ways. And I think they don't, they don't realize the extent of their influence because they're not, they're not aware of some of the biases that they might have. So for one example, of these biases, tell I, us, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the biggest one that I see is I, I think a lot of parents are biased by their desire to see their kids safe and successful or say literally safe, I guess, more than successful. And I see this time and time again, where a parent will sort of close their minds to an alternative path that a kid has suggested, because it frightens them a little bit. It's like they'd rather have them go take a safe and cushy path, as long as they know, like, okay, well, at least they'll be they'll be okay, you know, rather than, than willing to to let them risk a little bit. And sometimes it's those risks that are the most important things. And so I work with kids to kind of teach them how to deal with that. And I know firsthand, like there's a lot of kids who are experiencing just a ridiculous amount of pressure from their parents right now to, you know, follow the path, stay on their conveyor belt, go through school. And, you know, that, that can that can have a really negative impact on the kid's life, even if they have a great relationship with their parents. And, and usually they do. Usually these parents are, you know, really loving, caring parents. It just like I said, I, I think the biggest thing is they, they tend to be biased by their desire to see the kids safe. Yeah. Well, I will echo that. I think, too, the saddest part that I see with with being a parent is that you do get a lot of pressure. I mean, I had this experience this, this last week weekend where my oldest son, you know, he's about ready to graduate and within our church, you know, what, is, what is, what's his plans on that? And how's, you know, is he going to go do this? And there's a lot of pressure. Like I got yelled at oh, yeah. this weekend, basically like, <laughs> you know, to be a good parent, you need to push your son in this direction. And, and yeah. he was telling me, but I don't want to go in that direction. So you're almost like kind of keeping up with the Joneses of like, you don't want to feel yeah. like you're a bad parent because you're not moving the direction that everybody else is. But at the same time, you're like, I need to trust my kids. You know, you want them, you want to do this self-directed uh, movement, but when the rest of the world around you is kind of brainwashed in the idea of like, yeah. well, these are, you know, to be a good parent, you've got to be making them do this and this and this. When in reality, if we could just trust our parent, our kids. <laughs> and in fact, I got the last laugh because he ended up having some medical emergencies that, you know, it was like, if I would have just trusted him, and I did, I did, I went back to the person that was telling me, like, look, you know, this is what's happened. And I'm going to support him. And I don't care what you think of me or any of those yeah. things. Because I mean, it, there's a lot of pressure out there to kind of stay with the norm, you know, to keep with oh, the totally. norm. Yeah. So that's what I, I tell the kids, too. It's like, I think in this whole like alternative education movement, when the kids kind of become aware of it, like, I meet a lot of kids in college, for example, who want to leave and who are are scared of their parents or don't who, want who to start are mad. Yeah. <laughs> they can get mad at their parents too. Like they get mad at them because it's like, oh, they don't understand me. They don't, you know, they don't get why I want to leave school, all this, you know, stuff. And, you know, there may be some just anger there, but it's not super productive to be mad. And it, it's helpful to help understand the other perspective. And and the other perspective is often like, like, like you said, the parents are under a lot of pressure by friends and social groups and society to, to do the right thing. And, you know, and they don't know everything either. Yeah. And that's the other thing. I, I mean, I, I tell these kids, look, stop treating your parents like all knowing deities, you know, like they're, they're people like you, they have a lot of knowledge and wisdom and you should use it, but they're also fallible and they don't have all the information and they're biased by their own life choices and everything else. And so I think it takes a lot of pressure off the uh, relationship and allows genuine discussion to start happening yeah. when the kids stop coming to the, the table with like, my parents know everything, you know, Yeah. So that's a big thing. Or, or the parent thinking, you know, my child knows nothing. Well, and, and really, I think that we could come to a, a better educational system for our kids if we would work with them. Like I saw a really sad picture of a teacher who she'd made a box of like, oh, put your cell phones here. So and then the kids would have to go back and use pen and paper. And I'm like, OK, let's go back yeah. and use horse and buggy. I mean, the, the, <laughs> the teacher or the parent or the and if we worked with the kids of how they could use their cell phones as an educational tool and even some of the stuff that they're doing, like with the gaming and stuff. I mean, it's kind of opening my eyes of how how good that can be for your kid too to focus oh, on the gaming because that's the world they're going to live in and i think that's the saddest part about our education system is we're trying to take our kids back to what we had when in reality their their reality is working with a cell phone every day you know and i've had some great really great uh, self-directed education type people on and some of their after comments i really have to post because we 
we talked about this of like, well, you as a mom, how often do you check your phone? You know, why are we yeah. why are we limiting your kids of checking their phone, texting with their friends? I mean, we do it as adults. We use it as a GPS. We use it. I used it this morning to read a great article about this type of stuff, you know. Yep, absolutely. So if we could work together with our kids, I think we could have a better educational system for sure. Well, and if you if you actually sit down with the kids too and you watch them playing some of these games, like with online games, like they have intricate social circles, social yeah. hierarchies. They have, you know, digital economies. They're creating, you know, sometimes masterpieces of art on some of these games. And it's it's really incredible to watch. So it's it's helpful to just kind of sit down and, and take that perspective as well. That's awesome. Great. Well, and I kind of want to hear what you've been doing. You know, I was looking on his website and he has been speaking just all over the world, basically. <laughs> and I, <laughs> yeah. I want to hear kind of what, what's been going on with that, you know, the seminars, the online and the speaking that you've been doing as well as the online webinars and live streams yeah. as, as well. Tell us about that. Well, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. It just kind of started picking up uh, in the last you know, seven, eight months or so really from the fall last year is when it kind of really picked up. I'd done some speaking before, but I had an opportunity to, uh, to go to Europe and speak in Bosnia. And I was, so I went to Bosnia and spoke there at a university, kind of about, you know, the same topics that, uh, you know, we've been talking about now. And also just, you know, number one, self-directed education, how to build a career now while you're in college or by skipping college. And, uh, you know, sort of gave like an interactive talk in Bosnia. And that led to an opportunity in Serbia, which then led to another opportunity in Serbia, which led to, you know, an opportunity in, uh, let's see, I went to Prague and then I went to, uh, I just, I just returned recently from the Ukraine as well. Uh, Athens, speaking there. I have done that. Uh, Belgrade. Uh, yeah. So I spoke in Athens as well. Yeah. There was, there's, uh, I spoke in Rhodes and it's just been fun. It's, they, I got, you know, really one, one talk kind of leads to the next. Typically, there's always like someone there who points to another opportunity. And it's been great. It's been really exciting to see just, how the, how this message has spread overseas and how many people in Europe are are just begging for alternatives to their education system and looking for new options. And I think the thing I've noticed most is so many kids just feel completely helpless, like, you know, they're going to graduate and then that's it. And it's like, well, what do I do now? There's no opportunity. No one's taught me how to go out and, and build a life on my own. And so it's been saddening to see, but it's also been exciting that these kids are, are just taking it into their own hands to start figuring things out. And uh, it's it's been a ton of fun. You know, it, it was not something I would have expected as, you know, a 23 year old giving talks kind of around the world. Uh, this was not really what my plan was when I dropped out of college, but it just kind of kind of fell into that. And it's been uh, it's been great. Kind of an organic thing, too. So and has that led to like all your online webinars and your live streams, yeah. too? Yeah, I do a lot of online webinars now, um, you know, which is with, with campus clubs, mostly just because I, I can't get everywhere, you know, and I've, I've been doing a lot of traveling in the last in the last year or so. I've flown like over 170,000 miles now. Wow. And it's just like it gets to the point where it's like it's too much. Yeah. And so I've, I've been kind of stay home more and do some like, you know, webinars kind of for campus clubs and stuff like that, that it's much more scalable and it's just easier it's on my health and easier on yeah. uh, uh, you know, my, my work, frankly, too. So I, I've been doing that. Basically the same thing. We always do very interactive talks and, uh, you know, talk a lot about Praxis, talk a lot about uh, sort of the ideas behind Praxis and, and you know, get into some of the uh, curriculum content so that the, the kids can get a taste of, uh, of, of it and, and start, you know, implementing it in their own lives. And it's been fun to watch students, you know, start blogs, start side projects and businesses and start podcasts and and really start behaving entrepreneurial in their life and, and creating things as opposed to, you know, just sitting there and studying. I worked with a kid recently who's a high school dropout. He's 18 years old. And uh, we sort of talked about some of his goals. And he just, for whatever reason, wants to be a news anchor and not like a political news anchor. He wants to be the guy that reads about the weather and reads about like the local news. And he has an incredible voice. And, you know, he thought, you know, I need to go back to college to do this. No one's ever going to hire me as a news anchor. But he recently just landed a, a, a full time job in Michigan as a news anchor. And so he's literally awesome. uh, out in the field uh, producing, uh, producing news, recording on uh, weather and uh, daily events and all sorts of stuff. And he's doing great. So it's been fulfilling, I think, to, to kind of see these kids do it. And also just eye opening. You know, I, I think. I've always worked with a very narrow range of careers. Most of the kids that I work with at Praxis, for example, are, are going into startups. 
But, you know, outside of that, I, I've gotten to see kids do, you know, for example, do news news anchoring. And, and that's something that a lot of people say, there's no way you can get that job without a degree. Yeah. Well, and that's why I love being part of Praxis is that I think I really see you guys changing the world. I'm really hoping that the whole college perspective of that, that's the direction you have to go to be successful, you know, dies down so that we can we can use that more self-directed all the way through our school. You know, a lot of the people that we have yeah. on our podcasts are homeschoolers or self-directed learners, and then they go off to college. And then all of a sudden, yeah. because we all feel like that's the direction we have to go. And in actuality, that's not. I wonder, too, if some of your like if you're seeing in the job market too, like things that that we think wouldn't be as like you could make a good living at because of the Internet. I mean, and some of the startups and stuff that you've seen, is it possible to, you know, be an artist and actually make a decent living with, you know, have you seen stuff like that, too, that maybe oh, some of those jobs? Absolutely. That, yeah. yeah. No, it is, this is the, the thing that's exploding more than anything is essentially the ability to build a career out of out of almost anything you want. Um, what I'm seeing among the young kids that I work with now is like uh, I mean, just a much higher. Well, number one, I think they, they transfer jobs a lot more. And the, the most successful people tend to think of their jobs as projects rather than like a, a conveyor belt career where you're at the same company for your entire life. Like you're just sitting to, out the and, hours, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. And then they, you know, they have other things they're working on. And I've seen people, you know, building careers as photographers really quickly, uh, building careers as bloggers, um, you know, making full time income off podcasts, you know, making full time income as as coaches or um, just consultants, you know, or someone just who just takes on projects. A lot of the kids that I know now, like they just make their money by doing multiple things. Like I know one guy who has an online shopping uh, store for some clothing that he sells. But then he also does like some consulting, he does some investing, and he just does a mix of stuff. And it's, he, you know, he makes more money than the average employee kind of sets his own hours and uh, uh, is, you know, doing really great. And if he wanted to go get a, a normal kind of job, he could do that as well. Um, you know, one of the ways mind, I, I make but... money is I do a lot of, uh, you know, coaching on the side, essentially for young people who want to kind of land a job. And so that's something that just sort of picked up and it, it was not something that I have any formal credentials for, but you know, through the internet, I've been able to connect with people from Ecuador to India. I just spoke last night with a kid from Canada who is, is from China originally. And, you know, this is all through, through the internet. So it's certainly, uh, certainly much more possible. And this is another thing that I, kind of to get it back to parents and stuff like that in general, like the kids just know more about the internet than the parents do. Yeah. You know, it's changing now as, as you know, younger parents are, are, you know, having kids and stuff like that. But in general, like right now, today's, today's youth just knows a bit more about the internet. And so a lot of parents don't see the options that the kids do. Yeah. I keep trying to encourage my son's girlfriend. Her parents are definitely more, they think differently. Like they want her to go into environmental science, but she's an amazing artist. And I'm like, start an yeah. Etsy shop. You know, do that kind of thing. Oh, I probably, her parents are probably like, you need to get away from this lady. But I'm like, follow <laughs> your passion, you know, do what you can't give yeah. it. She thinks she can't make any money, you know, being an artist. And I'm like, that's totally oh, not. No. I mean, people, you're, you have so much more exposure now. And there's uh, the possibility of just doing what you love kind of going off Isaac Morehouse's book, you know, just yeah. do what you love and yeah. let the chips fall to where they may. Like you said, you're having so much opportunity that's just coming to you in different ways. I think it's cool too to, for kids to think of things that they are doing in a multiple of different streams. You know, I think that's different than their than my parents' yeah. generation of like one job you go to that from eight to five, you come home and you watch TV. These kids are doing, I mean, nowadays to be successful, you've got to have a variety of different things, you know, be an Uber driver as you're doing, you know, doing yeah. uh, consulting as you're doing this or that and multiple streams. Yeah. And you can, you can do all of that and you can still work less than the average person does. You know, a good article for your audience to read if they're interested in sort of this, this idea of, of building an audience and making money as an artist. It's called 1000 True Fans by Kevin Kelly. It's an excellent article about, you know, essentially breaking down like why all you really need is like a thousand people, not a huge customer base. You don't even really need a, a, a thousand people. You can have 500 people, you know, and you can, you can build a full time career as an artist of, you know, just, just with that. And I think it, it sort of demystifies the process and demystifies the idea of, of what it means to be a financially successful artist. But, you know, 
absolutely. If you're interested in starting an Etsy store, start an Etsy store. If you want to start an eBay store, start an eBay store. If you want to sell products on Amazon, do that. Like all of this stuff is possible. I know a kid who's making money who, uh, like I said, he, he started a, a t-shirt shop on uh, Shopify and he built that and uh, he's making at least half of his income off of that now. That's so awesome. it's it's yeah. totally possible to do it. Before we go on, please listen to these messages. If you're a young person who doesn't want to be one of the statistics of students who get stuck in debt and post-college job stagnation, check out Praxis and go from student to startup in nine months with a guaranteed full-time job offer. Let's talk to Derek and hear what Praxis can do for you. Hey guys, this is Derek. And uh, you know, if you're interested in learning more about Praxis, Praxis is a 12-month startup apprenticeship program for young people ages 17 to 26 years old who want more than the standard menu of options out of their life, out of their career path, and out of their education. So we take people who are you know, potentially thinking about going to college or who are in college now or even have graduated college and you know, are sort of just dissatisfied with the options available to them. And they complete a, a six-month boot camp where they learn really sort of the ins and outs of how to market and sell themselves as a young professional, how to learn on their own, how to learn professional skills, and, and really prepare for entering the, uh, the job market. And then they complete a six-month apprenticeship at a startup that is paid. It's full-time. You're making $15 an hour. And you're learning directly from successful business people, successful entrepreneurs, people who are actually doing what you want to do with your life, doing it in the real world rather than just teaching it in the classroom. That six-month apprenticeship, once you finish the program, you have a 98% employment rate for people without a college degree, uh, average income of about $55,000 right now. And our graduates are doing really, really well. They're doing incredible things. They're writing books. They're starting businesses. They are uh, getting jobs that would be traditionally closed to people their age and doing a lot of uh, incredible stuff. To find out how Praxis is changing the paradigm of education to ignite their participants' future, go to discoverpraxis.com backslash mind and review exclusive information for Luminous Mind listeners. the Luminous Mind with Derek McGill. He's a career expert helping others find the work they love. Well, I noticed that, you know, usually it says usually you give talks or highly actionable discussions, but you focus heavily on audience questions. You know, what are some of those top questions that you find yourself answering over and over again? Yeah, well, people always ask, like, when I knew I wanted to drop out of college, um, that's always a big one. One of the big ones is how do I talk to my parents about it? What do I tell them? They really want me to go to college. What, how can I approach them uh, to talk about it? Another one that I get often is I have this kind of career interest. What can I do to get this kind of job? That's one of the big ones right now. And those are probably the biggest ones. The other ones you know, tend to be kind of random. Like, how do I learn this skill outside of class? How do I start a, a, a blog on this? How do I figure out what I want to do with my time? That's another big one. What's some of your advice on some of those topics? I mean, what are the things that you keep saying over and over to some of these people? Yeah. So, well, well so for the uh, how to figure out what you want to do in life, I mean, the, the best advice I can always I can give really is just get out of a situation in which you're you're constantly distracted by things that you hate. This is you know going back to Isaac's book, and just get out of that situation, remove yourself from that. So, if that's college, for example, r- remove yourself. From from that and then just go start pursuing things that that sort of interest you you know if it's a uh, an opportunity to to help your friend with his, a social media project or something like that or if it's starting a simple blog where you write about uh, you know some kind of particular interest you have let's say you're you for whatever reason you're reading a bunch of russian literature i'm i'm reading uh, dostoevsky right now so i just thought <laughs> of that um, for whatever reason you're just you're doing that we'll start a blog on that and then maybe um, from there, like go find, you know, a, a conference you can go to where you can you can talk about that or, or, you know, find an academic journal that you can read or publish an article of your own, you know, somewhere else and and, and, and start just kind of doing that. And, and the more you put out there, the more you'll learn about what you like to do, what you don't like to do, what you're good at, what you're not good at, what you need to improve at. Um, and the more new opportunities will come to you, things that you could have never never even thought of before will start to come to you as you sort of build this portfolio of experiences. I think a lot of kids, they just feel like 
you know, be, because I think I think this is partly because of school, because they grow up and they go to college and they have to choose a major and that major sort of defines who they are as a person. They treat their career like that and they treat their their life outside of school like that as well. It's like and they're paralyzed by the fact that in the real world, there's not a course listing, you know, and, and, and there's not a neat little category that you can put yourself in. And they're terrified by that. Yeah. And they don't know what to do in the absence of that. You know, again, for me, it's just just go out and try a bunch of stuff. Yeah. You know, and you'll figure it out. It kind of reminds me, you know, mindfulness right now is kind of this the big buzzword of of how to deal with your mental health, you know. Yeah. But I really think that that really comes true to your education, too, of, you know, kind of going back to Isaac's book of don't do the stuff that you hate. Really be thoughtful about like, wow, this just drives me insane or, you know, but I think yep. we get so used to just like having to go do do certain things that we don't like that we stop listening to ourselves of what our really our true passions are. And we really do need to have more mindfulness about, you know, what is really what are the things that if you could do all the time, you would never put down, you know, and maybe that's yeah. video games, you know, maybe. Yeah. But if you can find some way to capitalize on that in some sense, then, you know, that might be a really fun job for you, you know, a direction for you to move in. Is that kind exactly. of where you're what you're thinking on those lines? Yeah, definitely. And I, I would say, you know, in, in terms of like, yeah, I guess because the other big question is like, you know, getting jobs or getting professional opportunities. I think, you know, the, the, the advice that I typically give people is like, stop being passive in the job process where you're just sort of like waiting for opportunities to come to you, for example, like get on a Craigslist or go out and, you know, to people that you know and find opportunities that exist and just pitch yourself just sell yourself like like you would be uh, uh, selling anything else. Just sell yourself. Just say, here's what I can do for you. And a lot of opportunities exist that you would have never thought of. Uh, the other thing I tend to tell people is, you know, don't go after the opportunities that you see just on college fairs. You know, some of the best opportunities exist by, uh, you know, working for free or cheap for a, like a podcaster that, you know, or, you know, working at a conference that uh, is local to your town or um, working at a small business. Like these are opportunities where there's like no competition, whatever, to get these kinds of jobs. And you can learn a lot more because you're going to be working directly with the founder of that business or the founder of that project. And a lot of kids just feel this pressure, I think, to go after some brand name company to go work for. And it just ends up being like they, they just have no chance at getting a job because these companies are getting a thousand, two thousand applicants and they're never even going to see your application. Yeah. Well, and if you do get hired, you're not really moving the needle in that company either. Whereas like with exactly. some of these small startups, you're actually helping to drive, you know, you're you're driving the cells and you're driving the the content. You have a lot of say in it. And so I think that's really awesome advice. What is your advice to kids of how to talk to their parents? I mean, we kind of chatted at that at the beginning, but yeah, you know, the, the advice I, I tend to give is there's one thing you can do. I think you can you can propose a gap year, you know, if, whether you're in, you're in high school or whether you're in college, you can kind of propose just taking a year off or even six months off and giving yourself like a predefined timeline with which to get something done and kind of prove that you're capable of, of working in that environment. I found a lot of parents are more open to that than just like full dropping out. That's one way to go about it. Well, a gap year is really popular in Europe. I mean, it's yeah. not like it's never, it's never been tried. <laughs> so no, exactly. And, and it's, it's really like, a, I mean, for me, it's like a no brainer. It's like, why don't you do a gap year? Even if you do plan on graduating, it's a valuable experience. But I would say the other thing that I tell these kids is, is kind of, I mean, sometimes you just have to say no and just do what you want to do, especially if you're like over 18 and stuff like that. And, you know, do it in a nice, respectful way. And if you have a good relationship with your parents, again, you keep in mind that your parents want you to be successful. They want you to be happy. They want to have a relationship with you. Keep that, keep that in mind and then go out and, and live your life do what you want to do, be happier and more successful than you would be if you stayed in school and give it time, but they will come around typically. Yeah. You know, I, I think a lot of kids, they, they just think like, if I ever disappoint my parents or if I go against their wishes on this one issue, like it's over for our relationship. And that's just usually not the case. You know, usually it's just go out and prove yourself, go out and, and show that you can succeed and uh, I think they're going to be happy. That's what happened, with, at least in my situation. My parents definitely did not want me to leave school. But once I once I left and I had about six months or so, they started to come around. And now they're telling everybody not to go to school. <laughs> and I've seen this play out so many times. And it's like 
it's advice that feels weird giving because I'm not a parent and I'm not trying to like tell these kids just go d- ramp it and disobey your parents and, you know, cause a scene, whatever, you know, and a lot of parents kind of take it like that. It's, but it, it really is like, just recognize that sometimes you have to show, not tell essentially, and they're not going to trust or believe you until you just go out and do it. And that's okay. Well, and if we would just both think better of each other, you know, like we think yeah. that, yeah, the parents want the best for me. And then the, the students are, you know, the, the parent to also think that, this kid has his own passions and abilities. And, you know, I need to trust that. I mean, if we could just work together, I did read an interesting article that talked about, you know, how younger people, and we have this idea that they're all these partiers or whatever, but they're actually, because they have this better relationship with their parents, they're less sexual promiscuous, you know, there's less of that promiscuity, there's less drinking, there's less stuff like that, because we have a different relationship with our parents than like I did, you know, where there was like this rebelliousness. So, there can be good and bad with both of that. And we've just got to hopefully kind of mesh those together and make that work. I want to hear about some of your topics, especially, you know, we talked about your book, um, how to get any job that you want. I want to hear about the top career mistakes that you think that young people make. Maybe that yeah. goes with your book too, but. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, uh, oh, and by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm currently writing an updated version should hopefully be done with that by the end of the summer. Awesome. And we'll be releasing that one on Amazon. So yeah. I'm pretty excited. That. I want the link um, as soon as you get it done. So <laughs> I, absolutely. So regarding like career mistakes, there's a bunch of them. I think one of the biggest ones is you know essentially overpricing themselves or or choosing money over long over learning. And that can um, be because like of student loan debt that we've talked. I mean, yes. I advertise that on our podcast all the time. Yes, it could definitely be because of student loan debt, and a lot of times, I think the majority of times it is. Um, it can also just be like they want to they want to be able to say I make this amount of money. And it's just sound or they feel like they need to make that amount of money. And the thing that I've seen, again, play out over and over and over again, is that for like the first year or first two years of your salary, unless you're making a ton of money, it's like not going to improve your life at all. And you're not going to have any more money left over at the end of the day. Like whether you make $60,000 a year or whether you make 30 or $35,000 a year, like it's, it's pretty much going to be negligible in terms of quality of life and in terms of the amount of money that you have left over by the end of the year, just because these kids have never managed finances before and they've never had a budget or anything like that. And they end up just wasting it on useless stuff. And then like, so, so whether they're making 60 or whether they're making 35, they're just going to spend it. And what I tell kids is, look, it's much more important in the first couple of years in particular to get some really amazing experiences that can put you in a position to succeed later on than to go get the the highest salary. For example, Um, when I got out of college, I was fortunate. I did freelancing and uh, I made a, a really, really good amount of money for my first year and a half or so. But then I, I took a big pay cut to go work for Praxis. Uh, Praxis was small at the time and I essentially pitched and created my own job. And I even worked for free for a good time. But that put me in a position now where you know I can make more money, but I can also go speak. I can do writing and, and workshops and seminars. I can go consult with a lot of other startups because I have a lot more credibility to my name than I would have if I were just working on my own. So getting in that kind of experience and then also just getting to see like what's it like to grow a business and a growing startup in a new industry. All of that stuff taught me way more than I could have gotten, you know, keeping that salary that I was making on my own. And, you know, the kids that I see do the best are the ones who kind of recognize that and recognize like the income and the money will come. But just go out and find something that's really interesting to you and that's going to teach you a lot about the world. That's that's I think most kids just don't do that. They take the job that pays the most yeah. um, and then are kicking themselves down the road later on. The more money you get, the more they own you, too. I mean, you know, some of these startup places, they're totally fine with you kind of branching off and doing your own thing. I mean, in addition to what they're asking you to do, you know, so. Exactly. Exactly. I think, you know, the other one is I kind of call it the preparation mindset is, is like embracing this mindset that. And you get this in school, but it's like, I'm not qualified to do something. The imposter syndrome kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, it's imposter syndrome in a sense, but imposter syndrome is kind of like when you're, I think imposter syndrome is kind of like when you're in the act of doing it, where it's like preparation mindset is kind of like, before I can get started, I need to do a ton of other stuff. And, you know, it ends up kind of taking all of your dreams and goals to the grave, essentially, and you end up not doing anything. I just see this time and time again as well. Like the kids, they want to do something like start a blog or they want to just take on some kind of new opportunity. And it's just like, I need to go study or take these courses or get these certifications and do all this stuff. You know, reality is more often than not, you're, you're more qualified than you think. 
that's a big one that I that I think I see. Well, and they lose the drive, think, right? Is that what you're saying? Like once they go, yeah. they go and they do all the stuff, it just like deflates the whole balloon and they don't want to do it anymore. Whereas if they just would have just launched themselves in that direction and just started doing it, then their passion for it would increase and not fizzle out. Yeah. And you'll learn a ton in the act of doing it yeah. much more than you will in just reading about it. I think those are the most important ones. The other ones is like waiting for the perfect job to arrive. I see this time and again, like I, I talk to kids who are like, even when I kids who apply to Praxis and I'll be on the phone with them and, and they'll be kind of asking me about some of our business partners and some of the opportunities that could come to Praxis. And I'm like, okay, cool. Well, what are you interested in? And they're like, well, I really want a job that's going to allow me to exercise my passion for Mandarin Chinese and, you know, eighth century choral church <laughs> odes and, uh, you know, this like obscure branch of philosophy and also like marketing. And it's like, what's like your job? Like that's a kind of an extreme example, but I, I just see it over and over where the kid wants the most perfect job. They want everything, all the stars to align before they can take this job. And they're terrified that like if they take it, it's going to limit their options in some way if it's not exactly perfect. The thing I've realized is like the best opportunities, the most exciting, fulfilling jobs. If you if you really want something that's going to match and check all the boxes, you kind of need to create it. And the only way to create it is to get your foot in the door first. Again, I, I kind of bring it back to me. It's like I've wanted to kind of be an ideas person. I've wanted to be able to do, you know, public speaking and a bunch of writing and stuff like that. But, you know, I would have never found a job like that. Like there's not a lot of companies that are going to be like, here, you're 20, 22 years old, 23 years old. We're going to pay you to come be a public speaker. You know, we're going to pay you to go into podcasts. We're going to pay you to go write. You know, like there's just not a lot of positions like that. You get to go travel. And, and like if you want to do that, you have to get your foot in the door at the company and then take the resources at that company to build something valuable and create your own position. Yeah. And that's something that a lot of kids miss. And so they end up turning away opportunities that are otherwise good. Yeah. Well, and I kind of want to blame that back on parents. I see a lot of parents that like they want their kids to get these top grades so they never have them take a job. I really think that the work environment, getting them in the work environment, they're actually going to learn more than they would getting an A in a math class. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, oh, that, that experience, the job experience, we I think that's really sad that a lot of people don't get job experience really young because they learn so much about themselves. And then that might launch them into, you know, a career that they would like. I mean, I harvested potatoes as a, <laughs> as a kid at 12 yeah. years old, and that made me never want to be a farmer ever. And, you know, so yep. it launched me in a different, but it, it did set a mindset to your work ethic and stuff. I was just actually reading an article about on fee that talked about how kids can actually it could even help their mental health in the fact that they you know being part of the job market and serving other people is actually really healthy for their brain and that you know it's stuff oh, that they no wouldn't question. get at school they would that they don't get the even with good grades they don't get the attaboys that you do when you're serving other people and treating them well in that that job market uh, no question at all i mean some of my first jobs and the first work that i started doing like you know, there was nothing that was better for my, um, I guess, you know, insecurity or um, social aversion or, you know, you know, sort of mood swings, let's say, than just working. Because, you know, when you're on the job, too, and you're, you're, you're let's say you're in a customer service role, you can't really afford to, to let your your sadness over a particular thing that happened or, you know, your mood swings or, you know, the fact that you're feeling bad one day. You can't really let, afford to let that get in the way like you can when you're in kind of school and stuff like that. A lot of kids, you sort of pick that habit up. And so when you're working, it, it sort of breaks out a lot of bad things that you pick up as a young person growing up. And, uh, you know, the earlier you can start to do that, the better. Then you don't have the disgruntled like, Walmart worker yeah. at 35 telling you all their, all their <laughs> problems. Exactly. And, you know, bringing it back to experience, that's the other big mistake people make is just not getting experience early on. And then you graduate and you have no skills, no work experience. You don't know what you want to do. And companies, you know, they don't want to hire you. You have a degree, but they don't care because everybody else has a degree as well. And a lot of kids just feel like, oh, my God, I can't get started. I need to finish my degree. And, and then it, they turn down amazing opportunities. I know a girl, for example, who um, she had a really cool opportunity to take this journalism fellowship. And she's a, she, she really wanted to be a journalist. And the journalism fellowship was going to pay her $55,000 a year for the first year and was going to get her published in, you know, 20 top publications, get her to all these conferences. It was going to be an incredible opportunity. And she was a journalism major. And she decided to pass on it so that she could finish her degree. 
when, you know, she could have taken a gap year, done that and then gone back to school. But now she's going to graduate college with a journalism degree, but not a lot of stuff to her name. And, you know, the likelihood of her being able to get a job that pays $50,000 a year is is very low for an entry level journalist, even someone with a lot of experience. Um, And so I just uh, again and again, I I see kids uh, pass on on job opportunities while they're still in school because they they think, oh, I I must finish. I must get official permission with my degree before I can start. (laughs) That's so funny. But it's true. I mean, that we make mistakes by passing up opportunities that do come along. So but I kind of want to close with your one of your other topics, though, of how to build a renaissance man for the future. I have to know what that's about. I mean, what, what, (laughs) what topic do you talk about on that? Well, so, I mean, it's it's kind of related to kind of some of the stuff we've been kind of talking about. I mean, it's it's always all, all related, but this was a, t- a talk that we gave at Voice and Exit this year or last year, which was a really cool conference, annual conference in Austin, Texas, and they're big friends of, of Praxis. And Isaac actually gave a talk as well there um, about uh, sort of the apprenticeship revolution. But, you know, the talk is really about I guess it's, it's 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 about using the the resources that are available to you, the abundance of information, the abundance of uh, access to to mentors and interesting people and interesting opportunities to just become the kind of person who, you know, rather than looking for opportunities and looking for jobs and looking for stuff like that, just just creates things. I mean, that's it. Just just takes on what everything that you find interesting and just does it and then does the next thing and does the next thing and does the next thing and and building this portfolio of, of interesting things across a ton of different spaces and spheres of influence so you might do something in, in in philosophy for example you might also do something in marketing and you might also be an artist and you might also be a podcaster and you might write a couple books and you might give some public talks and you might have a an e-commerce business as well um sort of embracing that and, and embracing that sort of mindset as opposed to looking for the certainty or the short term certainty that a job might get you. So that's a big part of it. It's 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 about, you know, learning in the real world, learning by doing, being OK with being a non-expert and still putting things out into the world. That's a big part of it as well. We sort of covered all of that stuff. I think, you know, a lot of people would be happier and more fulfilled if they stopped looking towards their immediate job for for everything and started just taking control of, uh, of of everything else outside of their job. You know, start a website, start a podcast. Who cares if you're that good? Who cares if you're that <laughs> experienced? You'll get better, you know, yeah. and you'll become more interesting and you will become, you know, a renaissance person. You know, you look at Michelangelo, you look at the people in the renaissance, you look at Da Vinci, they were inventors, they were artists, they were writers. You know, Michelangelo has, uh, I think, hundreds and hundreds of, of letters and interesting papers that he wrote. And, you know, this is sort of, again, it's the renaissance, man. You're a business person also, but and you're a thinker and a philosopher. You're a creator, you know, have all of that. And each aspect of it will reinforce the other. Yeah, definitely. Well, and and I guess that kind of, I think it circles back to what we were talking about with parents um, and trying to create that apprenticeship kind of praxis model. You know, do you have any, let's kind of end with that of give us some advice of how we can create that praxis apprenticeship model kind of in our own lives. Yeah, in your own house for for a younger age. Well, you know, I think there's so much that I could potentially I could say <laughs> it'd be hard to cover it all. But like, you know, it starts, I think, with learning and having a different relationship with learning. You know, right now there's there's well, number one is, is you know, just get out of the textbooks and, and start turning everything that you're learning into some kind of deliverable project, some kind of value created project. So if you're learning about you know classical Greece, for example, you might make a series of videos on that. Or you might uh, write a short ebook on that, or you might go to Quora and answer questions on ancient Greek military formations and stuff like that, as opposed to just looking towards the textbooks for for information and then moving on to the next thing, or looking for the textbooks for quizzes and tests and moving on to the next thing. Make your test something that happens in the real world, and then allow yourself the flexibility to do sort of deep dives much deeper dives into into content than you would traditionally be you know supposed to do in school. So like if you're learning about the Civil War, it's like and your kid just for whatever reason is super passionate about that, go to Gettysburg, you know, take photos at Gettysburg, you know, go go tour the museums, go go really be be okay with letting some other subjects slide in the short term so that you can really just invest in a particular topic and become good at that 
right? You know, like, and again, do a podcast on it, maybe do a 10 part podcast on things that you're learning about uh, the Civil War or something like that. Whatever it is, like, I think I think that's a, a better approach to learning than anything else. And you'll sort of get an apprenticeship from that. Um, connect with interesting people too. So, you know, if you are, you know, studying a, a given topic that you like, you know, find, find someone interesting who's, who's actually practicing it in the field and talk to them or find an opportunity to shadow them or connect with them over a phone call. You know, a lot of people don't realize that like you can speak with some pretty interesting people on the phone really easily. There's a platform called clarity.fm, for example, where you can pay by the minute to talk with some really fascinating people. That's awesome. And that's a much better way to get an education than, um, uh, just studying, I think. And yeah. that's sort of the practice mindset. Um, get an apprenticeship in everything that you do. I think that's that's one of the great things you can do. If you're a parent and you have a job, let your kid kind of shadow you on the job a bit. Let them kind of see your work. Be an example for them as well. I think that's that, that's probably the biggest thing. Yeah. If, I could, if I could put it in one thing. You know, my parents, I think... For me, I, I grew up with parents who ran a small business or really and it wasn't, it wasn't a small business, it was actually grew quite large, but they were they were entrepreneurs, essentially. And I think getting to see how they did their work was more influential than them actually teaching me anything directly. Just being able to watch them, it really it made the idea of building wealth and building products and services much less mystifying, you know, because I got to see you know, how they went about their work. I got to see their just the idea that like and in the end of the day, like my income will be tied to my ability to create value for others. And if I don't have a job, I can always just try to create some kind of valuable product or service. It made things a lot less scary as well. And this is not something they ever really, I don't think taught me directly, but just getting to see them in action. So if you're a parent and you want your kid to be an entrepreneur or you want them to be this sort of Renaissance person, you got to start doing uh, it yourself. It. Like yeah. it's not too late. You know, like you're podcasting, for example, that's a great example. Like if you're a parent and you want your kid to, to, to do podcasts or to do public speaking or to do blogging and stuff like that, do it yourself. Yeah. Like don't expect from your kids what you won't do yourself yeah. and understand too, like your, your kids are probably going to learn by example more than anything else. Yeah. Kind of like your last topic of criticized by creating. If you really yeah. want that as a parent, you got to be willing to step up and do it and don't live your life through your kids, but live your life yourself. And they'll, yes. they'll catch that vision all of on, yes. on their own. So, and I kind of want to go back to the idea and I think it fits nicely with the Praxis apprenticeship model is that, you know, for a long time, we wanted kids to be really well-rounded. Well, kids are well-rounded, yep. but they don't have any real skills. They don't have anything that they're really passionate about that they go about. I don't know if you've seen that Time magazine, the the study that they did that basically how, yeah, the Val Victorian, he's re really well rounded. He's got great good grades and everything like that. But he doesn't I mean, he doesn't become a world changer because he didn't have passion on, you know, one specific topic. And I think we need to get away from that. We need to go back to that apprenticeship model where we have a passion about something and we move in that direction and we know everything there is to know about that. Those are the people that yeah. really change the world. Well, and it's funny. You know, I, I, I see kids graduating who have gone through this sort of well-rounded education system, quote unquote, and they end up not knowing a whole lot of anything. You yeah. know, like they don't, and they don't remember any of their education either. You know, kids, you, you kids graduate, them, yeah. they don't remember like anything they learned in American history. They don't remember like anything they learned in biology or any of these general ed classes. They know very little of it because they weren't interested in it to begin with and they're not using it in their daily life. It's much better to just pick a subject, go deep into it, and then go to the next one when you're ready. And, you know, through that process, you will actually end up being surprisingly well rounded, but also just way more interesting. You know, way more interesting because you're the person who is known for, you know, two really cool, interesting things as opposed to someone who's known for nothing because you're just a generalist. I think th I think that's important is uh, certainly. Yeah, definitely. Well, before we say goodbye, maybe give us some final words and then tell us how our, our audience can get in touch with you and find out more about, you know, work that you're doing as well as maybe stuff if they want to find out about Praxis. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a bunch of different ways we can connect. I mentioned clarity.fm. I use that platform myself and I'd love to connect with any of your audience if, if, if they're interested in talking either about, uh, you know, how they can, you know, help their kids sort of, sort of adopt an entrepreneurial mindset, or if they're a bit older, how that, how they can themselves start doing it. My clarity.fm account is, is, well, it's, it's clarity.fm slash Derek McGill. That's uh, D E R E K M A G I L L. And I'm happy to connect there. My personal website is uh, McGill, M A G I L L dot C O, McGill dot co. 
And then you can go to uh, discoverpraxis.com as well if you want to learn more about Praxis and uh, sort of what we offer, as well as if you're just interested in kind of getting more educated on uh, some of this stuff. We have a blog that has you know hundreds and hundreds of posts, a lot of which have been uh, you know very popular and, and influential, I think, on a lot of people's lives. So hopefully you'll find some of that valuable as well. Well, I've never heard of the Clarity.fm. Anyway, I'm going to have to totally check that out because that sounds oh. absolutely amazing. Um, oh, it's awesome. I, I use it now to connect with, you know, a lot of college students and young professionals sort of to talk about uh, their career goals. That's awesome. Yeah. So great, great resource there. Again, Derek's contact information. If you want to find out just more about Derek, it's DerekMcGill.com. You can also email him at Derek at DiscoverPraxis.com. Uh, definitely check out DiscoverPraxis.com to find out more about Praxis. And if you do backslash mind, they'll give you extra links to that um, that are created just for our Luminous Mind listeners. But I really appreciate you coming back on, Derek, and discussing some just mind-blowing topics of, of education and yeah. how, we can, how we can change that paradigm. I appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. I love the podcast and uh, I'm excited uh, to see this episode and to see all the other people you're having on. You're doing a great work. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Derek McGill, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list. Then check out the services tab to see how we can continue to assist you, our fire starters. Also, to help us continue production of illuminating content, go to the sponsor tab at theluminousmind.net for more information on sponsorship and affiliate programs. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, Pinterest, and now Instagram. Get our free audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider these easy ways. Tell your friends about us, leave us a review, share our content. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. 